Right, the age of Aisha. Okay, let's talk a bit about the age of Aisha, people. Age of Aisha, radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet, right, uh, with the title, the mother of the believers. You see, I recently, somebody sent me a clip of uh, Sheikh uh, Omar Suleiman and uh, the Yaqeen Institute. So they have been doing a project for, I'm not sure whether it's all of 2018 or a huge part of 2018, I don't know. But they've been doing a project on the age of Aisha and they've run something like, so I just watched his summary khutbah. He's got like a sermon, it's on social media and Sheikh Omar Suleiman is speaking about, okay, this is the conclusion, people. We've done all the research there was ever to do. And he says, we've done it and we've done, we've run four projects in parallel. They've been operationalized in parallel. And one of them came with a conclusion of saying, well, okay, maybe Aisha was of an older age, but all three overwhelmingly said that, no, Aisha was definitely uh, a young uh, she was nine. And then he said, well, in conclusion, look, people, that she is nine. <laughs> oh, you know, it's not a laughing matter. I laugh. But honestly, I was so just disappointed. Uh, Sheikh Omar Suleiman, who I have respect for as a person, um, he's done great social work. You know, he, he stands up for the rights of people. He... Uh, you know, puts his life on the line in America, uh, standing up for the rights of black people, of Native Americans, of South Americans, uh, all these kind of things, which is amazing. And may Allah bless him for that. But honestly, I was so disappointed with what Sheikh Omar Suleiman said here. That look, with all due respect, he said, like, this is what he said in the end of the khutbah. He said, look, people... Don't reduce Aisha to a number. She was a person. Don't reduce her to a number. What on earth are, are you on about? Age is a number, God damn it. How can you... What do you mean? Don't... She is nine years old. Don't reduce her to a number. I mean, <laughs> try that defense in court. You know, like, oh, well, you're on a... <laughs> Don't reduce her to a number. <laughs> uh, no, mate. That is a sexual offence. You know, it's not like... What do you mean that don't reduce her to... Of course, people are... they. Your age at that age... Definitely these... Th okay, and here's my question. Here's my question. To these people that want to support this narrative of saying the age of Aisha was so young... And what's wrong with that? This is what they're saying. I asked them, then okay, what's wrong with four or three marrying a three-year-old or marrying a two-year-old? What's wrong with that? What if a person said, oh, I won't sexually, there won't be no penetrative sex. I'll just fondle her. I'll just touch her. Would you be okay with that? And what if they said, don't reduce her to a number? I know she's three, but don't reduce her to a number. She's a human being. Why is, of course it's goddamn disgusting. How, what, what, what does that mean? That how can it be that if, if the prophet married this, this woman and she's six, six years old, that is a tiny girl. That's disgusting. That it did not happen. And this argument that, oh, if this, if this was truly abominable and disgusting, then the Quraysh would have condemned the prophet. Well, they didn't condemn him because it didn't happen. That's a stupid argument. Of course. That, what, what does that even mean? Like, and, and you know, this like, kind of nice, Americanized kind of like all, uh, you know, this kind of, oh, she's a human being. Don't reduce her to a number. Like, what, I honestly, oh my God, I want to, ah, <laughs> this stuff enrages me. That what I that, that sounds nice. I accept that sounds very cute when you're talking about adults, <laughs> not when you're talking about a kid. That cannot sound good in any way, in any capacity, in any shape. Then then you can't. What is your then? Why nine? Why not five? Why not four? Why not two? 
If a person says, okay, I won't have... Like I said, if a person says, I'll just touch, I won't uh, penetratively have sex with, with the child, I'll just touch. It's still disgusting. It's still an abomination. It's still... There's no... This kind of stuff. And then to say, well, look... And Sheikh Umar Suleiman said, well, I'm not saying you have to do it. And I'm saying you can have your own cultural practices. But it's not a moral uh, judgment. Of course it's a moral judgment. Of course it's a moral judgment. What does that mean? What does that mean it's not a moral judgment? Of course it's a morality issue. It's an issue that it's a kid. What do you mean that's not morality? It's not a textbook issue, my friend. It is a morality issue. That is a moral... The slavery thing. You see, this is the irony that all... The reason... I'll tell you why these people are not saying that uh, they're refusing to accept the age of Aisha to be high. I have a detailed video, detailed showing that, first of all, and I will in future do a uh, uh, on the actual hadith. In my video, I just show how the hadith were unacceptable. I don't go too much into the chains. But I will show that every these few chains they have are all unreliable. All unreliable. The one by Urwa, the one by from his son Hisham in Bukhari, the one in Muslim. They're all unreliable. But put that aside. Let's just take, look, the thing that did this for me clearly, the thing that did this for me is look at the narrative. Human beings, we can look at, we can look at human lives and we can winnow out uh, other things and res we can have a result. In the year of sorrow, when the Prophet wasallam went through the most tragic of his years because he lost his wife Khadija, who was a support for him, and he had children at home. He had children, he had to look over them, he had lost his wife, he, had, uh, he used to earn for the family, he's, he's got that to, to worry about. He, his, his social protection came from his uncle Abu Talib. And Abu Talib died in the same year, within months. And now his social, so he became vulnerable to attacks, to boycotts. And then the Prophet goes to Ta'if and is humiliated and attacked. Now that, there's nothing more than that as a nail to seal that kind of depressive, catastrophic atmosphere for the Prophet. At this stage, he is approached by Khawla, and this is in the Sahih, you, this is a Sahih Hadith. He is approached by Khawla, who, has, who is like an aunt to the Prophet. She has a very maternal role in the Prophet's life. And she says to the Prophet, look, I see you very depressed. Why don't you marry? And the Prophet kind of, he says to her, well, who do you have in mind? And she says, I've got two people in mind. And one, she says, a young uh, a young lady and one she says somebody a divorcee and the prophet says well who's the divorcee and she says soda and the prophet says and who's the young lady and she says well uh, the daughter of your friend Abu Bakr Aisha so the prophet sends a proposal to both now let's just pause there for a moment Aisha doesn't go through immediately because she was already engaged and hence the prophet marries soda first who was the prophet's age now, let's just pause there for a moment. Khawla sees the Prophet depressed because of this tragic year. So she advises marriage. What could marriage do? Marriage could help the Prophet in four aspects. Okay. It could help the Prophet, um, first of all, through by taking care of the home. A woman in the home could look over his children help him with his children to, to free up some time and space for the Prophet. It could help, that's one way. Another way is there could be emotional support and companionship for the Prophet. He could find some solace with, with a wife. He could, he could do that, that's another way. There could be intimacy. And sorry, with the emotional support, there could be intimacy and providing not only emotional support, but also peace, tranquility, um, and intimacy as well. Another way, right, that she could be uh, looking, it would free up time for the Prophet to be working. Okay, so the Prophet could go to work, he could do these things. And perhaps she could help the Prophet 
with the da'wah, with the mission. So these aspects are how a wife could have helped the Prophet at that time of tragedy. Now let's just take that into perspective. That's a real, you don't need to be a genius to understand that. That's just common sense. That a wife coming could help you emotionally, she could give you intimacy, fine, that's excellent. She could take care of the kids and she could help you in your da'wah. These are four key areas. Now, let's just go back to this picture that they're painting. The Prophet approaches Aisha, according to Bukhari, and she's six. That's younger than his own children. What is the point of bringing another child home? Like, what was the point? Like, I know, I've got children to take care of. Let's just bring another child home. Well, she can't help you emotionally. She's younger than your own children. She can't, she's not incapable of intimacy. Uh, she's, uh, she can't really take care of the children. The children would do a better job of taking care of her. The, the, some, some of the Prophet's kids were, were much older than Aisha at that stage, if she was six. Right? And she definitely can't help with the da'wah. She's just a six-year-old kid. So in every way, that is a stupid suggestion. To say, well, I know. Oh, you seem really stressed out. Why don't you just take another kid home and babysit that kid? That makes no sense. It makes no sense. Let alone now you look at the other evidences. And with that narrative in mind, you look at the hadith in Bukhari, how... Uh, how other people couldn't go to war. And uh, uh, Sheikh Omar Suleiman speaks on this as well and other people. And they say, yeah, but you see, there's a difference because uh, Aisha, when she was in war, when she went to the Battle of Badr or Ahud, when, when she participated in these battles, she was help carrying water to the sick and the wounded and, and helping dragging bodies and stuff like this. She was uh, attending the wounded. She wasn't fighting. And when Ibn Umar asks in Sahih Bukhari and the Prophet says, no, and in the Battle of Uhud in Bukhari, he allows him by asking him, how old are you now? And he says, now I'm 15. And the Prophet says, okay. But he was going to fight. So they tried to draw this distinction. But tell me, having a 14-year-old boy help drag bodies and carry water is much better than a 10-year-old girl. By any standard. On a battlefield, a boy that is 14 running around dragging bodies or bringing water is still much more helpful than a 10-year-old than ten year old little girl. Everybody would agree. I mean, if you had a choice to say, well, all right, I've got to take, right, okay, I need somebody that can run fast, that can bring water, that can carry things, that can dr maybe bring armor, that can bring arrows, that can... Dr would, you, would you say, I know, I'll take that 10-year-old girl? Or would you take a 14-year-old boy? So the arguments don't match. And then the fact that Aisha was already engaged and she'd been engaged for a few years to Jubaid ibn Mutta. And what was she to when she got engaged? And then when Jubaid's family call off the engagement, what does Jubaid's mother say? She says, oh, we don't want her because we're afraid she's going to convert our son. What, a six-year-old is going to convert a man? Jubaid was a grown man. He's worried that a six-year-old girl is going to convert him ideologically. At that time, when the Prophet approached her, she was at least 17, at least. That's what the maths show. Now, most people say, I mean, everybody pretty much accepts that Aisha passes away in 50 Hijri and she is 67 years of age. Now, you just w work that backwards and how old does that make her? So, and some people disagree, but... They, they, they put it a bit forward, a bit back. But what I'm trying to say is look at even when you look at the maths. Now, then you've got verse, then you've got hadith about Aisha saying things like, I remember when Surah Al-Qamar was revealed, this verse in Surah Al-Qamar, I used to be a, a young girl that could understand things. And that verse was revealed like something like eight years before the Hijrah. And the word Jariya is used for a young girl, like somebody who's at least something like, 10 onwards and she says kuntu jariya aqil i was a jariya who could understand things yet they've and i just want to put all this aside and say look even if your research was like hmm and the only reason these people are not saying that aisha was 
older, I'm telling you, wallahi, this is the only reason. Is uh, there's two there's two things. Th this is for the sensible sheikhs. I'm saying there's other idiots who are doing this just because they know it provokes the West, and that is the worst kind of people, right? And that is the worst kind of people. But these sheikhs are not doing it for that reason, uh, inshallah. Like not like people like Sheikh Omar Suleiman or Yasser Qadi and these kind of people. They're doing it just because they haven't got the courage to be the, f because they don't feel they have a precedent. I guarantee you, if one Salafi sheikh had said this, just one, if they had the precedent, they just worried that we haven't got a precedent and our sect will kind of condemn us. That's all. Because if, let's say, Albani had said this, they would have all said it now. Because Albani had said it. It basically, all they need is somebody, like they don't have the courage to stand alone. And they need somebody that said it. So they're saying, yeah, but all the scholars in the past, I don't want to go against them. I don't want to go against all this number of scholars. But the truth is, this was not a debate back then. And people in the medieval ages, but let's just look at what all the scholars in the medieval ages said. They all said slavery was okay. They disagree today. They wouldn't dare say slavery is okay today. All the scholars in the past said slavery was fine. They said there's a consensus on this. They go against that. They say, well, oh, yeah, but it's OK. No, and don't. And will they dare say slavery is not a morality issue? Of course, it's a morality issue. So all the scholars, do you know what Ibn Taymiyyah writes? Ibn Taymiyyah writes that there is ijma. He says there is a consensus that if a Muslim unlicensed, that means without permission of the imam or the leader of his state, sneaks into non-Muslim territory, it, whatever he steals, this is what he writes, whatever he steals when he comes back is halal for him. He says because the kuffar have no indemnity when it comes to their wealth, when it comes to their uh, property and stuff like this, because they are non-Muslims living in Dar al -Harb. He says there is ijma on this. You just have to Google it, it'll come right up. Ibn Taymiyyah's fatwa. That the wealth of all kuffar in their territory, so long as they don't have an agreement with us, right, in Muslim lands, is halal. So if anybody sneaks in, he can steal it. If he steals it and comes back, it's his. That is utterly haram. But Ibn Taymiyyah says this, Ijma, most scholars in the past would have thought that's fine. I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if almost all of them thought that. Because, you see, back then the world was a different place. They had dehumanized non-Muslims, just as non-Muslims had dehumanized Muslims. So my point of saying this is just because the scholars in the medieval ages didn't say this doesn't give you the license. And today this is such a big deal. And hadith are khabru ahad anyway. No hadith can provide certain knowledge. They are khabru ahad. So the honor of the Prophet is conclusive. If anything will bring a blemish to the honor of the Prophet and it is inconclusive, it's based on khabru ahad, we reject it. Let alone the fact that this argument has so many holes in this, in this argument anyway. Right, so that's my point of, of making that. So I was really disappointed, honestly, in, in listening to, because I was kind of thinking, Alhamdulillah, at least they, you know, that even though they've said this after a while, but Alhamdulillah, at least now they're going to say as well openly, that look, we can't say stuff like this. There isn't enough evidence. Um, there is problems in this chain and the honor of the Prophet and stuff like this. And they just came and said the same thing, that, oh, no, she was nine, but... And the Prophet married her when she was six. But but hey, don't reduce her to a number. She was a human being. <laughs> well, Your Honor, and that, Your Honor, is my defense. <laughs> no, how, I'd just like to say that how dare this court reduce these victims to a number. 
they were human beings, God damn it. <laughs> well, that obviously won't work well with the jury. So, look, that's, I hope, inshallah, people can hear this message. And, ah, oh, please, this is so disappointing. But, yeah, let's... Uh,